presentation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and we'll just get started. And Emil, everything will be recorded. So you see pop, people popping on and asking questions. I just have the one screen, so you'll have to field all the questions. Did you hear okay. Emil? Say that again. Okay, say that again. I said you're going to have oh, to yeah, gotcha. questions because I only have one screen. No problem. On, on site today. Yes, 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 yes. That's fine. Mike, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Let me mute. Okay. Uh, oh. yeah, he Maybe he's thinking it up. Okay, well, let's get started because I have to I have other meetings that are backing up to this too. So we can kind of go through the content and then um, go kind of from there. Does that sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So welcome, everybody, um, to the November Alteryx User Group. And go ahead and get started mm -hmm. with some announcements. And then from there, um, we'll dive into the 2018 demo, as well as um, the saving hours with Alteryx, calculating daylight savings benefits, and then we'll do some Q and A from one fifteen to one thirty. So, how many of you guys have uh, attended and Inspire this past year, or interested in attending Inspire? Uh, Emil, did you, yep. you had attended Inspire last year? Yes, I I attended. It was an amazing event. I mean. I think just by thinking about the networking that you can do, I mean, uh, over there, it's, it's pretty amazing how you can learn from from many other folks um, that are, you know, in the same industries or, you know, how they are using all tricks. It's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, how can you get inspired? Like, you know, it's, it's funny because it inspire you. You can get inspired too to to use this tool in, in another level. So it, it's worth going. I mean, definitely. I mean, you can network with people from your same industry and learn from them. Um, so it, it's, it's worth going and attending this type of event because then you can see what's coming up, how people are becoming, you know, very creative about using this tool. So it, 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 it's, it's definitely a, a must. And if it's in Nashville, I mean, I mean, that would be amazing, right? Music, food, so you name it. So, Nancy, are you going to come this year? To I will see if that if that's possible. I'd like to. <laughs> awesome. All right. So that's actually coming up next June. Um, you can register ahead of time, and if mm -hmm. you do it before the end of the year, there's uh, huge discounts for that. I think mm -hmm. it's actually mm -hmm. um, like a little bit under a thousand dollars right now. Um, so it's, okay. it's a great opportunity to get a good discount mm -hmm. uh, and go ahead and and book some some inspiration. And then if if money is the biggest concern and reason for not going, then what I'd really recommend doing is um, actually signing up for this next piece. So mm -hmm. if you have never spoke at uh, an Alteryx event or even the, the conference before, it's an incredible experience and I would recommend doing it. Um, so if you have something that's really disrupting the status quo at the office um, or you're looking to dissolve the data conventions uh, in mm -hmm. either your team or in your department, um, what they're looking for is, is people who are looking to share. And mm -hmm. you can go ahead and register for that um, before January 4th. And put in what your use case is. So they're not looking for it to be fully flushed out by January 4th, but essentially a high-level idea of what you're interested in sharing. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they evaluate all those um, individual um, applications, and then they select users from there. And then all of those users um, who are selected will receive a free pass to Inspire. Nice. Yeah. Do do we have any users who are interested in doing that? Um, 
who who would be interested in in presenting next year? Uh, John, I see you're, you're on the call. Are you, you going to present next year for us? Or Mike? Yeah, or Mike. Say that or uh, Emil, are you going to? You should be presenting. We need some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I need to like. Yeah, I'm not sure if I will be allowed, but let's see. Maybe. Uh, if you, I want to. If you, if you are, yeah, if you are interested in presenting, let me know, and I can, I can help get you guys mm -hmm. set up. And that's pretty straightforward. So you just go to uh, the Inspire site. So right here, um, Inspire nineteen CFS mm -hmm. hub dot me, and then you can do a demo tape if you want. And. So a quick plug-in, if you're looking for some more specific content to your industry, there are the industry and departmental user groups that Alteryx uh, hosts. All these are virtual because of their size and then obviously the uh, geographical breakdown. But right now we have the transportation user group and then obviously the healthcare one which is the oldest and then the brand new one is actually the mm -hmm. the finance user group and those are the meeting schedules for um, some of the meetings that they're having this quarter so you have um, the finance uh, inaugural user group I think is it the first one maybe it's their second meeting uh, their second meeting is coming up here um, in just a couple weeks and then the healthcare one is that first week of December and you can navigate to those. So if you just go to the user groups page, the same way you found the Orlando one um, up at the top. Um, let me show you guys that real quick. Just do a quick share. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So if I go to community.altrix.com and I go to alternation user groups, and then you'll notice there's one up here at the top, that's industry and departments. And then you can just mm -hmm. select which one you want to go to here. So um, let's say it's healthcare, which you're looking for. Uh, then here's the healthcare user group, and then there's their meeting information right there, which you can dive into. And you'll see that it's a, a web ed, a WebEx as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they have some great Most content. Most of them are virtual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have some great content that's specific to um, mm -hmm. the, the industry and can give you some more uh, insights into what people within your specific industry are doing with Alteryx. Yeah. And then, as always, if you're not connected on the community, I highly recommend doing that. Um, Emil, you want to talk a little, little bit about your experience on the community? Oh yes. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do with um, Altrix for good. I mean, uh, we used to do a lot of things here in Central Florida uh, with Kids uh, World, uh, Kids the World, and, and different other um, community um, associations where we are helping them uh, with maybe kids with data or um, people that need, you know, different like. Um, Individuals they need to help them with the data. Maybe there's size a nonprofit um, where we're able to, you know, help them and get, you know, them in, into this space of uh, data. Where maybe they don't have this tool, so we're we kind of like tell them, hey, you can get these tools for free if you're a nonprofit <laughs> um, and things like that. And also, um, you know, also you can do many many things related with the community where. Um, it will help you, I mean, improve your skills, but also help other people. Um, the other thing with the, if you go to community.altrix.com, I mean, you can find definitely a lot of different use cases. I mean, there are weekly challenges. There are amazing ideas. You can develop tools, macros, apps, see how other people are doing it. I mean, you can do a lot of re-engineering, and, and you can figure out things. Uh, so it's, it's definitely... I mean, a great idea if you want to expand your skills and get involved with the community. All you have to do is just go to communityoutreach.com and you will find tons of resources. Yeah, and right now I know there's even the HTML5 
uh, tool creation mm-hmm. competition where you can win mm-hmm. one of the uh, retro Super NES uh, consoles. The, the winner's going to get one of those, and you can add mm-hmm. on to your badges, uh, like the ones that you can see up here at the top. They have mm-hmm. tons of badges um, that you can kind of add if you're looking for some some mm-hmm. digital swag. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so one more uh, plug in as far as resources, which these are great resources. Yamil, do you want to you want to mm-hmm. take this one again? Because I know that um, that you've been using quite a bit of these. Uh, yes. Uh, so the interactive lessons. I mean, this is great because then you can do this in your own time. And for example, I am been doing this in my lunch time, like a lunch and learn on my own. Uh, just go there and you spend thirty minutes, whatever, wherever you can spend. I mean, there is different ones you can spend twenty minutes, thirty minutes, depends on where you're looking for. Uh, there's also live training if you prefer to be involved with others and be able to ask questions. Um, then, of course, the weekly challenge are a lot of fun. I mean, they have, for example, weekly challenge related to, um, it could be now for Christmas, they have um, Centralytics. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get that soon. Um, and then also you can do product certification. So the great thing about this certification is that they're totally free for now. I mean, and they, and you can start getting your certifications for free. I mean, maybe in the future they will charge, so take advantage of that now. And all you have to do is just sign in. You you sign in for the certification. You can take it the month after you sign in. And I mean, so far I th- I think there's no limit how many times you can take it. Is that correct, Andrew? Like if you yeah. don't pass the first month, yeah, yeah, you can take it again, so right? You, so you can schedule any number of months that you mm-hmm. want, and then essentially mm-hmm. for the month that you uh, schedule for, you get three attempts mm-hmm. during that month. So wow. let's say, for instance, mm-hmm. hey, I just want to kind of see what the test looks like. I can spend the mm-hmm. first one doing that if I really wanted to and just kind of do that as a mm-hmm. practice test. And then mm-hmm. um, the second time I could push for it for real and get an understanding of, okay, here's how that test worked. Here's how I did when I was trying mm-hmm. to push given the time allotted. There's study guides here. And then... Mm-hmm. We had talked about the those interactive lessons, which are good. So you can mm-hmm. see, like, each of these interactive lessons, let's say I'm an Excel user, I can learn all of these different uh, skills one at a time, and literally these only take a few minutes. So you can see average mm-hmm. one here is literally six minutes. And then let's say, for instance, I'm studying for that exam, they have the live training sessions that are going on, and they even record these. And as part of those recordings, like you can see here, they're on their third one. But this is for certification prep, and they're on part three. So you can kind of join some of those sessions if you're looking for a specific topic or looking to study. And you can see they're yeah. doing them literally every week. So there's tons that are available here. We, we literally have four pages here that exist. Wow. So uh, they're... There's tons of resources that are available, and all of these are free. I think that's the, the most amazing part. And there's people here on the community that are looking to support you. Um, mm-hmm. The local Orlando user group is looking to do that. And if you guys are interested, please go ahead and, and message us in the chat, because what we would love to do is uh, create a study group for some of these. And mm-hmm. we can um, do that maybe once a week or once every um uh, like on the weekend even, and just meet for an hour and help kind of push each other and ask questions so we can can kind of drive uh, the learning here in the Orlando area or even virtually. So if there's, I know there's a few folks that aren't here in Orlando who are just looking to learn or um, looking to help out, what we would like to do is mm-hmm. uh, kind of take that to the next level and help people get, get certified. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of it for announcements. Um, did you guys have any questions about announcements, or are you, uh, do you have any, anything else that you would like to announce in the, in the Altrix space? It's good to know that you all are open to um, allowing non-Orlando folks to participate even in the Orlando uh, kind of initiative. So I'll pass that along. Yes. That might, yeah. Yeah, please do, Absolutely. Nancy. So um, that's part of the reason why we're doing uh, virtual user groups as well is I know that 
Orlando itself is a pretty dispersed area, but if you have people outside of Orlando who just don't have a user group around, um, that's part of what we're here for is to um, kind of share with everybody. So we do the intention, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit mm -hmm. more about in our December meeting, um, which is December, is it 13th or 14th? I know. Do you know? I can't remember what. Uh, I can find it for you real quick. Uh, the 13th. So yeah. December 13th is our next meeting. And what we're mm -hmm. going to be doing is uh, standardizing the, what the meeting times are. So it's going to be the second Thursday of every month. And then mm -hmm. during two of those months, so the, the first two months will be uh, mm -hmm. virtual. And then the third month will be in person. Um, sorry, it's mm -hmm. the other way around. The first month will be uh, in person, and then the second two will be virtual. So every quarter we'll have one in person meeting, and then the other two mm -hmm. months will be virtual. And then as we continue to ramp up, if we need to add more physical meetings to that and swap them out, we can do so. Um, but part of the intent for that is um, we all have busy schedules and making sure that uh, everybody can mm -hmm. attend, and then we also get the recordings in as well in case you miss a meeting. And so with, with that being said, if you guys have any feedback for that, please attend our December meeting because we're going to do a little bit of a town hall around what everybody would like to see next year, what our tentative ad agenda is, um, and then also is there anything that we can do in terms of um, All Tricks for Good um, project-wise. Mm -hmm. We have a couple ideas in mind, so we want to kind of share those with the group and get people involved with the community and volunteering. Yeah. So, so with that being said, um, we're actually going to dive into a demo. So um, we did have 2018.3 on the schedule, just an overview. So that has been out for a couple months now. Um, and then 2018.4, if you didn't catch it, actually came out yesterday. And so I got really excited and started diving in right away. So I want to make sure that we share that as well. Um, so essentially, dot three and dot four, we're hoping for like seven before the end of the year with how quickly they're rolling these out. Uh, so so uh, Lauren or Kat, if you're on the call, we're, we're, we're excited and we're hungry. Agree um, here in the Orlando area to see everything that you guys are developing, and we're we're happy to share share that. So let's kind hey. of dive. Go ahead. No, no. Thanks again for the the quick shout out there, Andrew. Um, this is Kat over here at Ultrix, and we're super excited to keep you guys always up to date on what's out there here mm -hmm. with Ultrix. So this 2018.3 and point four, we're really interested in hearing your guys' feedback. So um, please feel free to chat us, or even you know just chat with us here on this call, so that we can continue to develop these updates and make sure that we're getting everything that you guys want out of Altrix Designer and the server here too. So feel free to dive into it. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. And so what I'm going to do is I have a few slides talking about some of the, the major updates, and then I actually have 2018.4 installed. Um, so we can kind of take a look at that because there's some huge um, updates that have been done on the visual side in terms of 2018.4. So I want to give everyone a preview of that um, in case you haven't had a chance to look at it. So real quick, there's been a lot of tool refreshes that have occurred um, over this last year. Uh, and what we want to do is make sure that everybody is kind of aware of those and, and sees what, what tools are changing. So with 2018.4, um, if you guys are, are experiencing any background noise, can can you mute your your mic? Because we're getting some some scratching noises a little bit. Um, okay, so with the the tools, so two of the big ones, uh, text to columns, and then the sample tool got some refreshes. So I'm doing a quick slide for this just to kind of show you guys. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and dive into 2018.4. So you'll notice that the the logo actually kind of changed here a little bit down here on the bottom. Uh, and then when we're when we're diving into this, we can see that um, when you're looking at the, the canvas, there's a handful of things that have, 
have kind of changed here. So we have the tool palette. They've changed it out to silhouettes now, and that's kind of moved up to give you free up a little more real estate. So you can kind of see that the tools themselves are still the same, but just the, the tool categories have some silhouettes. And then the the run button, which is has been up here for um, for a while, actually moved down over here to the right. And then you have the scheduling button here as well. And then you can also um, toggle through the workflows here. That, that button's um, a little more obvious. Um, and then you can do the plus and minus uh, both for the workflows and for the, the zoom in, zoom out. It's all right here next to each other in the canvas. And then we'll see the same refresh for those silhouettes down here for the messages and files. So we can kind of see that changing up. And then let's dive into the tools a little bit. So we have more being converted to the HTML5 uh, format. So you can see the sp split column, sorry, select the text to columns tool um, is HTML5 now. So it offers a little bit more flexibility in terms of the menus that are kind of popping up and just gives a, a fresh look to um, the text to columns tool. And then the same with the, the sampling tool. So what I like about this one in particular is it does allow for a little more interactivity with the uh, group by column. Um, just again, a, a cleaner look. And we can continue to see that occurring as they start to refresh more tools. And the big one that um, if you're doing any coding, um, I know this was a, a much, much anticipated release on 2018.3, um, the Python tool. So the Python tool has officially been added. Um, with the Python tool, this is a tool that can be on, put onto the canvas. So it's, it's not the Python SDK. So um, this Python tool actually has uh, utilizes Jupyter Notebooks interface, so you can uh, step through the code if you would like, and um, it brings access to a whole new set of libraries um, that will be available now instead of just having the, the R libraries at your disposal. And this will also integrate with uh, the Python SDK. So if you guys haven't seen uh, the Python tool, let's take a quick look at that. So you can see the same uh, smooth interface that's here. You can access your kernels and go ahead and, and run and shut those down as you want. You can do specific cells. Uh, you have the much of the same functionality if you've used Jupyter Notebooks before. Uh, you can go ahead and, and copy some of that over or pull it in here. And then the same uh, saving. So you can go ahead and save whatever script you're working on. Um, you can step through in the same manners. So this is this is a great functionality that I'm really excited to see. And um, I know Kat, what I what I've gotten a lot of questions around um, lately is uh, when are we going to see the the R tool get the same refresh? Um, so I'm hoping to. Um, kind of move that move that up the list. We have a lot of, of users that are looking to kind of consolidate um, some of their tool sets. And if, if they had something like Jupyter Notebooks um, for R, um, then we could uh, start moving a lot of the, the data scientists in the Orlando area, um, as well as I did another site visit out to, to Iowa the other day, and they, they were looking for the same thing. Um, that way, they're not having to tr transport their code. So um, is, is that exciting for, for anybody? Are you guys excited uh, for these pieces at all? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so I haven't seen any deprecation with these tools specifically, um, but there is actually one, Michael, that um, I have seen that does cause a problem, and that's actually the email tool. So Michael's question is, um, after the tools have been refreshed in this newer version, 
is there any issues that people have experienced in terms of legacy workflows not working? Um, obviously, that depends on what version you started on. Um, I've, I haven't had any issues once I upgraded to the 2018 series. Um, it's more getting past those major uh, the the major version changes that you'll really see some some issues. But there is one that I do want to note. Uh, which if you miss the release notes could cause a problem. So if you notice here with the email tool, how many people are, are kind of using the email tool here? So I know that, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I know that a, a good majority of the people are um, in terms of emailing out reports or they have notifications set up to let them know when uh, workflows are run if they're looking to do something more advanced than the uh, event triggers. So here, this is something pretty big. Uh, they took off the auto detect for the SMTP. So you have to hard code this in here. And that was for uh, security reasons, just to make sure that um, all tricks can comply with all the environments in terms of security. So um, I know like uh, healthcare, that can be a huge aspect, making sure that uh, it's not auto-detecting. Um, I'm pretty sure most of the people who are here creating Alteryx workflows aren't spamming people, <laughs> but we want to make sure that um, it's not using the auto-detect and it's relying on someone manually inputting it. Um, that way we can make sure that the organization's email environment uh, is sound. Yeah, and that's that's definitely true, Michael. The, the auto detect um, worked most of the time for me, um, but whenever you uh, run into issues, the it, it gets difficult to uh, troubleshoot what the the problem is because it's it's doing some things on the background and having it clearly stated um, makes it a little easier um, and consistent. And most of the time, it's just uh, like mycompany.smtp.com. Um, so the, the, it's not like you're looking for something complicated where it's this huge string that you'll have to work through. Um, and then the next biggest feature, um, and this one is pretty huge, and I'm excited to, to work even faster. Um, <laughs> going through my day, it's, it's difficult having to uh, pull from a database that may be non-performant, or um, if you're working on developing and you're repeating the same workflow over and over again, uh, how do you go about making those iterations faster? And the biggest add-on for 2018.3 and 4 um, is the, the caching. So you can cache almost anywhere now. So there are a couple limitations around that. And I have a, a section of a workflow that I can kind of demo that out where, where you can and can't do it. So there's really only two limitations, and that's um, what's called no loops. So anytime the, uh, your data streams kind of diverge out, so they, they, well, let's say I, I have a um, filter tool and I have a true um, branch and then a false branch uh, of data stream that I'm working with and the true uh, maybe I'm just passing it through in the false I have to do some manipulation on, and then I'm joining those back together. Um, it won't allow you to, to cache in a midsection during that, but as soon as I rejoin those flows back together, then I can go ahead and cache after that point. And I know tools with multiple outpoint, outputs, but what I can do immediately right after a tool with multiple outputs um, is drop a select in there and then go ahead and cache from that point and continue working forward. So um, what they were looking to do with the cache is um, making sure that um, even though we would love to cache at every point, we will also want to make sure that it's a good user experience. So rather than the, the cache, um, getting out of control, what, what they've set it up as is a means of allowing the user to have cash in as many places as possible, um, but without it consuming all of the computer's resources. So the way that you go about caching when you're on 2018.3 or 4 
is all you have to do is right click and then you can see this cache and run workflow. So whenever you do select the cache, you have to rerun the workflow in order for it to, to work. So let's say I want to cache at this particular point right here. So this is, excuse me, before um, the workflow branches out because I'm not splitting the streams of data here. Um, all I'm doing is just caching this particular two tool so I can go ahead and, and cache this. And what you'll notice is a bubble is going to form around this. Let me go ahead and delete this out here. Oh, kind of excited. Let's see. Oh, no, this is relative pathing. Okay, let me go navigate to this real quick. So I just pulled a sample workflow. So even if you guys are on the newer version and want to follow along with me, you can. So let's see what this one was in particular. Go help sample workflows. And let's go ahead and do, I think it was, this is part of the starter kit. And we'll do the sales pipeline. Yeah. Okay, so this is the same workflow. So let's say I want to cache right here. So I can cache this. And you'll notice a little bubble will form around this workflow. So that allows us to, now any time that I run this, let's say this is a badly performing database. Now I don't have to do those um, data pools every time that I run this workflow. That section of the workflow will actually be cached. And then from there, I can make sure that, um, that I'm not having to do that that every time. So let's say I continue to progress and I have all three of these and maybe these joins take a long time. So if you notice, if I right click here, um, the cache will be grayed out. So, so this goes back to what I was saying about it doesn't work on um, tools that have multiple outputs. But let's say this join right here, I go right after this tool. Uh, so after the second join, I go and I take a look. Immediately after that, I can go ahead and cache that. And so now you'll see everything cached up to this point. So did you guys have any questions about caching at this point? Or can I go through some more? And then was this helpful for, for everybody? Emil, what was some of your, your feedback with, uh, with the caching? Um, no, I mean, the feedback is a definite love it. I mean, this is definitely something that it was most needed. And there are some, also some questions in here. I'm not sure if Michael has some questions or John. Um, let me see. Trying to look through the chat. Um, yeah, so... And <laughs> Michael said it was anything like the bubble. <laughs> yeah. It looks yeah, like um, <laughs> 90s or 2000s, That's funny. yeah. And I think um, as we continue to to iterate through this as a community with Haltrix, can obviously provide more feedback. And I know that was one of the, the difficult solutions is coming up with something that's streamlined, but that clearly shows you and can communicate that um, what the cache point is. So another point mm -hmm. that I want to make here while we're looking at this is if you notice, I'm, I have this formula tool selected. And then let's say I wanted to make another alteration to this particular tool. You'll notice that, hey, I can't do that because it is cached. So you cannot manipulate tools that are, are saved back in the, the cache portion of the workflow. But anything that goes forward from here um, is interactive, and then 
like let's say I went ahead and, and ran this again, then that's the immediate start point is it's going to start from this formula tool and go forward. So I think this is um, a great advancement. So this is obviously the the first set of minor releases with the caching. So I'm sure we'll see some more refinement going forward. But I can tell you from experience, um, this is leaps and bounds over um, what I've experienced with other tools. And also, um, it has allowed me to streamline some of my process in terms of not having to containerize things or uh, do one-off uh, file saves like a YXDB so I can eliminate some of that processing time if I'm continue, continuing to iterate. Yes, and that's also true. So you, there, there is a catch to that, Michael. So um, Michael brought up another point where we're talking about, um, hey, can I um, cache in more than one point? So yes, you can, but the way that that kind of works is, let's say um, the rest of the workflow runs really smooth, but I want to cache at the data sources because um, maybe my SQL database isn't very uh, performant, then what you'd have to do in that instance is um, I could cache each one of these, which is similar to uh, the, the cache that used to be um, here in each of the inputs. So you can't see it here because it's an Excel file, but normally when it's a database, there's a little cache, file, uh, cache checkbox here. Um, so I know that they've already taken that feedback um, I haven't checked here on the community to see if that, um, or sorry, not in the community, in the release notes to see if that uh, came back in 2018.4 or um, if this is going to be like the Apple headphone jack where um, they're trying to, to push us to be better users <laughs> and teach us how to, to cache in more places than just one. Um, so as you can see, now I've cached all three uh, data sources and going forward, then I don't need to worry about the interaction with the, the database. And this actually does bring up um, one more uh, interesting aspect within Alteryx, um, if you're not aware of. So if you take a look at the, uh, the runtime section within Alteryx, um, let's say, for instance, I know that these tables should be joining with each other, but the development work that I'm doing, maybe there's a break fix that I'm working on, or maybe I just want to see how a workflow kind of operates. And I know that these typically join um, together, like there's tons of, tons of joins that are available. I could limit all of these um, inputs to where it will allow us to um, only see 100 um, 100 records coming out of each of these inputs as a max. And then if those joins are occurring, then you can see that data kind of funnel through without necessarily having to uh, funnel everything through. Yeah, so John, thank you. So yeah, the cache option still isn't available. Um, so if you are interested in seeing that come back, please, I think it's already an idea on the community. Um, Michael or John, if one of you guys see that idea already posted, um, if you can share that in the chat. And if any of you are heavily heavy users of that, um, we can go ahead and, and move that up the list and hit that uh, uh, like or love button or star it. So let's dive back into a little bit of the, the presentation here. And so we're going to go through a quick use case, and what we'll go ahead and do is I'll, I'll just go ahead and share those files here on the community. So if you guys want to navigate over to the community, and um, if you haven't registered yet, please go ahead and do that. And then what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and share those files here um, on the Orlando Alteryx user group page. And that will be right there in the meeting. So if you navigate to Orlando, and do we have anybody that isn't signed up um, on the community right now? Mm -hmm. 
everybody signed up. This is wonderful. Yeah, so let's go ahead and add these real quick. Yeah, and this is another quick thing to note. Um, the logos have also changed for your files. So we've got a little uh, JPEG that's available. Okay, so you guys should see those posted. So if you want to go ahead and download the start and solution file. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through a quick use case. And for those of you who are heavily active on the community, you'll recognize this as, as uh, maybe one of the weekly challenges. And what we're going to be talking about is a little bit of the, the light usage um, within a, a house. And what I want to do is, is have everyone work through this for a few minutes. And while you guys are kind of doing that, so here's your starter file. Let's take a look at this this use case here. So while you guys are doing this, we actually added some hints and some history about daylight savings time in here, and then an example of what you can do with um, light and time-based data and what an output would look like for that. So with this particular example, uh, we have a simple data set that's right registering and represents a uh, time of inhabitants where people are entering and exiting rooms within a household. And so we're going to assume that those people um, turn the lights on in those rooms anytime they walk in. Um, think of it like a motion detector. So if any of you guys have a, a smart house or um, are sitting in the offices with the smart lights and you know how you walk into the bathroom sometimes and if you're if you're still or you're just on the wrong side of the room, all of a sudden the lights go off. Um, this used to happen used to happen to me all the time at the old, old office. Like literally, I'd walk in and I don't know how long they had the sensor set for. It must have been like 10 seconds because literally I'd walk in and I wouldn't even have started using the bathroom yet or go to wash my hands, and I'd have to kind of jump around a little bit to get the the sensor to go off. And as houses get smarter, um, we'll be looking at how um, some of that electricity is used and how much we're saving. So we'll have um, different data points available for all that. So how many people have um, components of a smart house that they've added on? Um, Yamil, you have a couple things, right? Emil? Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, so I have a couple of things. Um, you know, when you go to the office, you can always say, hey, turn on the light, and you know, it turns on the light. I, I have a couple of things from my cat where it can, turns on the light and turns it off and a timer. So, um, and you can, I can get it from my phone, and, you know, it works great. So, I mean, it's just a matter of, I mean, putting together all those things, but, you know, ha what happens is, for example, in your car sometimes, I mean, you, you have your you have your time in your car, but you have to re reset it every time that they change the daylight savings because it doesn't communicate with the Wi-Fi. So things like that, I think it's, it's important to save some time, right? Yeah, so tell them a little bit about, I know we had talked briefly about your um, mm -hmm. the Google Internet and then how you have oh, your yeah. son who loves playing video games. And we'll oh, be yeah. able to do some time savings. So it's, it's pretty cool because you, in, your, in your phone, you can actually put some time for him to play, and you can actually select the, the specific devices. So you can say his iPad, his um, Xbox, or whatever you know he's using in his room. You can set it up to, like, you know, no more Internet after, let's say, 9 p.m. or something like that. 
So you can actually set up the specific devices. So that's the, the good thing about that. And if actually you're working on something and you need you need to you give your Wi-Fi up, then you can actually take all the other devices out for some time and give it to your device using the nice. so the Google, the Google app is is amazing. Yeah. For that. So, if, so if you're yeah. downloading some amazing Altrix data, then you can tell yourself, like, <laughs> "Hey, you can only have like 10 megabits per second, and I need yeah. the, I need the rest." <laughs> Everything else, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've done something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's take awesome. a look at this data. Um, do we have people working mm -hmm. on the, this workflow right now? Because what I would like to do is um, maybe have one of you present. Um, some of the ideas that you came up with. Um, if you can just put a quick note in the chat if, if you guys have started trying to solve for this. And then here's some of the extras that we have. So a little bit of the, the history. Um, if you guys haven't seen this before, um, these are containers um, with what are called Explorer boxes. So the Explorer boxes, if you go into documentation, um, it's this little guy right here. And what it does is it allows you to show a web page directly from your Canvas. So like this in particular, uh, let's go ahead and see. So we'll expand this box down. Oh, if I can grab it here. So apparently this is an ad, but we also have in here kind of a history of what brought daylight savings time and then how um, this kind of came about. And so it will give you a little mm -hmm. bit of a history. So this is great whenever you're, um, let's say for instance you have a history of a project or maybe um, some documentation that's in a Word file, you can kind of put it in in this uh, flat file and uh, it'll give you an opportunity to um, kind of share share some of this information. So if you guys want to scroll through that, um, it's great because it actually talks a little bit about World War II and World War I and where some of that daylight savings occurred and then also kind of dispelling some of the myths as, uh, in regards to like car accidents or people more prone to car accidents and during the shift for daylight savings time. And another big one that I saw is does it really save electricity? And that's a big topic for conversation now that we're in this modern age um, where we're not really doing farming anymore and we pretty much have the electricity running all the time for lighting and air conditioning and everything else, um, does it really save any electricity? Then we have some workflow hints. So as you're working through this, um, let's say for instance there's a lot of date time stuff here. So what, what are those functions? So this will kind of highlight um, what some of those functions are for you. Just straight from the help. And I use this sometimes when, let's say I post something on the community and maybe I'm having some difficulty with it. Yes, even the, the ACEs have um, some difficulty <laughs> with some of these uh, questions. We'll, we'll go out and ask other ACEs. Uh, but what's, what's great about this is I could put something here and let's say I got to go and work on another project. I could come back and see whether someone has posted on that. Um, or it's embedded with a workflow if I need to hand this off to someone else. Um, let's say Emil and I are working on something for the Orlando user group. I can hand off a workflow to him. And then if I'm having some, um, some issues, then I can hand it off to him and he can see, oh, he already posted about this. And if somebody responds, he has a good starting point to kind of test out some of the proposed solutions. And then from there, um, we have the, the final piece, which is when you're working with, with data, so a little bit of inspiration. So if you're working with daylight data, um, this is actually one of the, the visit of the days. 
And then, um, Yamil, you kind of want to, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Um, this visualization? I cannot see it. I cannot see it so well. Uh, it's a little hard. Um, but just going to click on, I mean, click, click, click on something in there, like, uh, so they can see the silhouette of the world uh, of the map. Yeah, let's, let's kind of expand this out a little bit so we can see it better. Mm -hmm. And here I also put the, the hi hyperlinks at the top of these pages. So if you guys want to mm -hmm. go directly to the hyperlink, um, you can do so. Um, but what I like to do sometimes within all workflows is go ahead and put the, the end dashboard in there. So we have in sites that are available, but let's say the Tableau dashboard's already built out, and I just want to make sure maybe there's a refresh date that exists here, uh, and I want to make sure that it actually refreshed. Um, how can I go about ensuring that, and all from the same canvas? And then here's the way that you can go about doing that. Um, and then what this um, has is this kind of shows the, the daylight over the entire uh -huh. course of the year. So you can see... Um, on March 20th, um, at this latitude, like close to the equator, there's about 12 hours of daylight per day. And then mm -hmm. say I go ahead and, and click on this particular area. Yeah. So it'll kind of show you where that latitude is at here on the map. And then it'll show you what that, that duration is. Yes. Um, there is a question in the in the chat for Michael. Good question. Uh, he said, "How long has the Explorer box been there?" Oh my gosh, it's been it's actually been there for a long time. Um, uh -huh. I've been using it for about two years now. Um, so okay. yeah, it's it's definitely a good resource that um, mm -hmm. few people know about. I mean, I think a lot of people use the common and send it to containers. Um, but I like this because it, it offers a, an opportunity to kind of have some living documentation. And if it already exists mm -hmm. somewhere, um, you don't have to recreate it twice. You can just uh, put the hyperlink um, to kind of share that. Very okay. good. So we've had uh, a few people working on on this solution, does any is anybody up for sharing um, something that they've been working on? Even if it's, it's not done, um, we can kind of take a look and, and work through the rest of it. Or um, I also have the the solution that's available here. What did you guys want to do? Uh, John, are you working on it, or, or Nancy? I think I saw who else. Bruce, I know you've got some some mad Altrex skills. Um, wow, I'm not sure I uh, can compete with you, Andrew. <laughs> so, so this one's actually this one's actually really simple. So I'll, I'll walk through. Um, one of the solutions that was shown on the community. So when we look through this, we, what we were looking to do is kind of see how much um, usage was was going on with the with the lights here. So when we're taking a look at how much has been used, what we want to do is also make sure that if there's any overlap, we're counting it only once. And the result that we want looks like this. So let's go ahead and run this, take a quick look. So we want to know how much time and minutes was used in the bathroom, in the kitchen, and in the living room. So in, in order to do that, what we want to use is the row generating tool. And this is the, the shortest solution. So literally, it's tool to two tools, and you're done. Uh, so with these two tools, what we're going to do is uh, do a date here, and then we're going to parse. And then you'll notice um, this IMP. So what is that IMP that we're we're trying to parse? So we have the the exit time that exists here. 
Then we also have the enter time. So we just kind of want to know what those things are and then figure out, hey, can we um, set up the minutes and kind of count between those? So let's go back over here. And then this is kind of where those resources and hints kind of come in. You can open up the second box. And you could click the, the help even on the, the tool and navigate to the functions. But um, we've made it a couple steps shorter for you guys today um, just because this is over your lunchtime. And while you're working on the sandwich, uh, we'll, we'll give you set it up to where you can do most of this one-handed. So as we're reviewing this, we want to take a look. So what what is that I? So it's doing a check to where it's looking at the 12-hour the clock, right? And then we also want to check on the M, which is, so there's a lowercase M and there's an uppercase M. So what, make sure that you're watching that case sensitivity. So you have minutes that exist there, which is, what we're looking for, and then the AM, PM. So what we're targeting is, hey, we want to make sure that we're working on a 12-hour clock, which means that we need to factor in the AM, PM, and then how many minutes exist between the start and the end time, and we're generating rows for that. So if we look, uh, when we're clicking on the tool, we can see the before, and then let's go ahead and take a look and see the after. So you can kind of see it's generating rows for each of those. And so for these from 9.52 to 9.55, that's three rows, which accounts for the three minutes. And the reason why in this instance we can just duplicate that row is because all we're doing is trying to count the minutes, which means that we can just count the rows. So then from there, what we'll go ahead and do is we'll go ahead and use the summarize tool. And we can group by room. And then we're just counting the distinct, right? Which if we count the distinct, then that'll give us the distinct instances for those. And that'll give us 68 minutes for the bathroom, 206 minutes for the kitchen, and 302 minutes for the living room. So let's say, for instance, um, these were minutes that uh, I walked out of the room and the sensors went ahead and shut it down. Now we could use these minutes to kind of calculate the kilowatt hours if we had the measurement. So let's say it's 10 cents an hour or um, let's say a dollar an hour. We live in California. It could be a dollar an hour. So how much money would we have saved if we kind of totaled all these things together? So let's go ahead and, and do that. So we'll add on to this a little bit. So we'll do a formula tool here, and we'll call this dollar saved. And with these dollars saved, we're going to take that field, so this count distinct, and we're going to multiply it. Let's say a dollar twenty-five, just to give us some different numbers here. And then in this particular instance, it's a currency rate. So let's just go ahead and switch it to a double. And then that'll give us the sum there. So now let's say this is a huge amount of data, so I, I can go ahead and throw the cash in here. So now I can keep revising this and see, OK, that's how much I saved in terms of dollars. And let's go ahead and add one more summarize here. So I just want to know what the total dollar saved is. And I can just summarize that. And now from here, I could go ahead and branch these two things off. So you can see I have $720 saved. I could branch these two things off. To where if I were doing a total here, or let's say I did a, 
the select statement. So we had mentioned if I branched off, I can't save anything. So I'm just going to kind of show that. You can see it's grayed out, and that's because I'm branching off and separating the data out here. So it doesn't allow you to do that. But if I go back even one step right before that, you can see that the cache is available. And then let's say I did one tool right after that. You can see that the, the cache is available again. So just kind of keep those things in mind as you guys are developing, but there's tons of flexibility that exists here. And this is a little bit about saving some, some time with Altrix. And if you are looking for a more advanced use case, um, I definitely recommend checking out this other one, um, which will be the, let's see, I believe it was 86 was the use case. And because we had um, some more time that we spent on, on some of these, um, we weren't going to have enough time to go through it. But what I do want to make sure is we share that with you. Give me just a second to kind of pull that up here. See if we can locate it. Now I'll post the other one on the community. So there's one other one. Um, actually, let's go ahead and navigate there now real quick. And I think this one, weekly challenges. So you can go here to the index, which this has all of them. Oh, I think I sort of changed my view. It's the other way around. See, we'll do the original view. There we go. Okay. So we have one other one here that exists, and this one's specifically about daylight savings, but it's doing an API call. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and post this and share this on the community as well on our user group page. So if you guys have um, some extra time and you're looking to understand, hey, how does uh, daylight kind of break out? And then if I'm doing calculations for those and want to generate something uh, like the visualization that we shared um, over here off to, the, off to your right, then we can kind of build that out using the data that's available from the API. So a couple quick projects for you guys. I hope you enjoyed um, this session with us. And then if you have any questions, we'll kind of open up the floor. Um, again, our, our next user group is going to be December 13th. So that's just a, a few Fridays away. Or sorry, not Fridays, <laughs> Thursdays away. So we've got exactly one month from, from today. And um, what we're going to spend the remaining 15 minutes on is open up the floor, and if you guys have any questions or things that you're working on, um, we would love to help you. Okay. Do we do we have any questions from Oh, from Michael. Off topic. Oh, weather data. Um, yeah, so I do use the weather data, and I use weather underground. Um, so Michael was asking, does anybody here use weather data in their workflows? And then if they do, do they use a an API to pull that data? Um, so I know that that's not always the case. So if if your company may have weather data in-house in terms of a repository that they're pulling from. So an example of that, Michael, would actually be um, at Universal and Comcast. 
So they own the Weather Channel, so I know that they have a huge repository that we've tapped into before um, where we could just pull weather data from there. Um, but a majority of companies don't have um, weather that's weather data that's available or have a reason for kind of capturing that and storing it in-house. Um, so I know that's not a, not a particularly common uh, repository, but something that people are interested in terms of sharing. Oh, no. Yeah, that is bad that you have to pay for it. Um, yeah, I can take a look. I know that um, with data.gov, they had some weather data that was available. It's not as granular, so it's more like uh, daily temperature averages. And then um, also when you're taking a look at looking for data, I know that Google just launched their, their data search uh, functionality. So uh, what was it? Let me see if I can navigate there. Data sets, and I can't remember if they use data science in front of there. Yeah, so they do own Kaggle, um, but there's another, I'll post that on the community as well. Emil, do you remember how to get to that? Um, no. Which which one specifically? Like the Google data oh. sets. Mm, I, I literally just no. had this up a, a second ago. Let's see. Mm, no. Yeah, so there is there is BigQuery. Here it is. So Google mm -hmm. Public Data Set Explorer. So if you navigate in here, I know that they have some data sets mm -hmm. that are internal. And then they're starting to scrape some of those things as well. And then let's go ahead and take a look at data.gov. Yeah. Data.gov will be great. Yeah, so they do have the weather data sets. And I know that this is free. Um, but again, it just goes back to the granularity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then obviously this is a, a little harder to pull. And literally, I mean, if you look, this is where like even the Weather Channel is getting some of their their pockets of data. Yeah, data.gov is pretty amazing. Yeah, okay, is that model? Yeah, and I know that they have. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the topics. I mean, you can. Yeah, let's see. Let's take a quick look at that. Nope. Yeah, so you can see it's under under climate. So they have this toolkit that you can kind of work on pulling data down from. And I've I've done that in the past where um, essentially you just start, you can use this to browse and get an understanding of how the data works. And then from there, what you're doing is um, you're pulling down using an API. And I mean, you even have these different topics. So related specifically, whether related to water or transportation, energy, um, some of the marine life. So yeah, there's there's tons of, of stuff that's available there. And if you guys are interested um, in, in weather in particular, just whether it's personal interest or looking to integrate some of that, we can do a user group just on the weather related data. Is that something that you guys would be interested in? Yeah, I, I am. Okay. Yep. All right, Emil, you're you're presenting on the weather data next time then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> next year. 
Yeah, no, I like I like weather data, so it's fun. It's you know it's very important, specifically for example in, in Universal where I work. I mean, we need to make sure you know we 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 understand what's happening with the weather because you know in travel in the travel industry you want to know that right, so you you understand better what's happening with your customers. They're coming, they're not coming. I mean, um, so. And that it will affect their decisions, you know, to to book travel or, you know, even to come here or not. So, um, yeah. and I imagine that with a lot of different industry will be the same thing. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something you want to learn and to want to learn more about. Okay, so we're getting close to time here, and I just want to make sure if anybody has anything to share, I'm going to stop recording. So the session was recorded in case you want to share.